Bob Quinn. Quinn, you are here. You have made it. I didn't see you initially. I was concerned. I was worried. I thought you had been kidnapped by the DeSantis campaign and sent to a tunnel in Gaza. But luckily you are, luckily you are here. And it is your turn now to ask your regular evening question, whatever it will be. Welcome. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, so first and foremost, congrats on qualifying for the third debate. Look Thank forward you. to hearing your perspective. And thank you to all of you who contributed to me to help to make that possible. I appreciate it. So as you mentioned in your opening remarks, uh, the third GOP nominee for speaker just dropped out. Um, the House currently looks incapable of governing. How can uh, candidates possibly coalesce around one Trump alternative when they can't even pick a speaker? And what does this division at the highest level tell you about your party's health? Thank you so much. Well, it's not very healthy in the House of Representatives, as I said off the top, um, Quinn. And, and, and part of that is because of gerrymandering, as you know. Um, we gerrymandered these House districts, so that there's maybe only 50 competitive districts out of 435. And what that means is for the 385 that are not competitive, all they ever care about is a primary. If they don't get primaried, they're in. The Democrats don't have to worry about a Republican. The Republicans don't have to worry about a Democrat. This gerrymandering is destructive. It's destructive because no one has to come to the middle. And that's what you're seeing inside our own caucus, is that there is a fight now between those folks who are in the competitive districts who say, look, my folks sent me here to govern, and they want me to do something, and not having a speaker is unacceptable. We need to get one. And then the people in the gerrymandered districts, which are the majority, who say, the hell with that. I only got to worry about as a primary. Gerrymandering is an enormous, enormous problem in helping to cause our governing divisions. And so one of the things that, you know, it's like term limits, though. The only people who can fix it are the people who are benefiting from it. And if you think Matt Gates wants to be in a competitive district, you're crazy. Marjorie Taylor Greene in a competitive district? I don't think so. You know, Matt Rosendale in a competitive district? No. Nancy Mace from South Carolina? No. Look, you're going to need a president who's willing to, like, put their fist down on the desk and say, we need to do something to fix this. And that's going to be hard, I will tell you right now. I can't guarantee you that I'd even be able to do it. Just can't. Because, you know, what they care about more than anything else in the world is the title. Much more than what they've accomplished when they're in the job. They care about the title. They like people calling them congressman. They like people calling them senator. And that ego problem, combined with the gerrymandering problem, is a really tough nut to crack. Now, as it applies to this race, you know, every day, Donald Trump's giving us more news and more information for us to decide to abandon him. And it happens quickly. I mean, think about just in the last 24 hours. Another of his lawyers, Jenna Ellis, has pled guilty in Georgia and agreed to cooperate and testify against him, not only in Georgia, but in the federal January 6th case. And then on my way here, a news story came out saying that Mark Meadows, his former chief of staff, has received immunity from the prosecutors and will testify against Donald Trump. Now, I want you to think about that. I will tell you a personal story about this. Because back in 2020, I played Joe Biden. I had to take some sedatives, but I played Joe Biden <laughs> in debate prep for Donald Trump. And it was right around the time that he named Mark Meadows his chief of staff. And he, Trump called me. And he was on the speakerphone in the Oval Office, and he said, I want to introduce you to my new chief of staff. He's going to be the next James Baker. And it was Mark Meadows. And I said, geez, Congressman, at least he didn't set the bar too high for you. <laughs> Only James Baker. Um, my point in telling that story is that I guarantee you, 
now that Trump knows he's testifying against him, Mark Meadows will become a lying thief, according to Donald Trump. All of a sudden, he will become scum. Sidney Powell, who pled guilty last week, now he says, she was never really my lawyer. I barely knew her. Meanwhile, he put out tweets saying she was an important part of his legal team during 2020. Soon, I'm sure, he'll be telling us he didn't know Rudy Giuliani either. <laughs> Hard time saying you don't know Mark Meadows. My point to you, Quinn, is that I know it's three months or so until New Hampshire votes. It's a long time. <laughs> Things happen like this now. Your generation is forcing this on us. You want to know everything now. You got your phone. You got your computer. You want to know it the minute it happens. And now you have the society you want. We do. We know everything like this. Can you imagine how many snapping fingers can happen in three months? And none of it's going to be good news for him. And you know why? Because he's a bad guy. And I used to say this when I was a prosecutor all the time. When my folks would bring me a case against a public figure, and it wasn't quite right, it wasn't ready, we didn't have enough, I would say no to the cases. And they would invariably, because these are young, aggressive prosecutors, and they'd want to bring the case, and they'd believe in it, and they'd say to me, boss, come on, you know he's guilty. And I'd say, no, 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 that's not the way it works. I don't know anything. It's what I can prove that matters. But what I used to say to him at the end of that was, but I promise you something. If he's as bad a guy as you say he is, he'll be back. Because they don't change their stripes. He'll be back. And that's what's happening with Donald Trump. He has dodged the law for years now. But eventually, when you keep breaking it, it comes back. This news today on Mark Meadows is the worst news that he could have ever gotten. And I've known him for 22 years, Quinn, and I can guarantee you tonight, when he goes to bed in Bedminster, New Jersey, 10 minutes from my house, <laughs> 10 minutes, he is going to be lying in his bed, staring at the ceiling, trying to remember every illegal direction he gave to Mark Meadows. <laughs> and so everybody who says, oh, the polls are this or that, and oh, how could it possibly be done? Three months of snapping fingers from a guy who's a bad guy. And so my party will tell me a lot about itself at the only time it matters. It's when they vote. I used to say to reporters all the time when they talk about my poll numbers in New Jersey, which would go up and down, and they were as high as in the 70s, they were as low as in the teens, and every place in between, because, man, I do stuff. And when you do stuff, people react either really well or really poorly. But I say to them all the time, I don't care what my poll numbers are, except on Election Day. That's when it matters. All the rest of the time is just, you know, running commentary on what people think of you from day to day. It shouldn't influence how you do your job. Do your job. So I can't tell you what the state of my party is. I'll tell you after they vote here in New Hampshire, after they caucus in Iowa. Is that my alarm? <laughs> Was that you? Does that mean it's time for me to stop and go home? No, okay. Um, so don't what you need to, to, and we need you to do it more than you need any of us to do it, you've got to believe that you can make a difference. You've got to believe that facts matter. And as many times as you see examples of right now where you think it doesn't, I understand you questioning it. But, you know, I got told this by a teacher in high school, my government teacher, he was stealing it from somebody, I'm convinced, because he definitely was not this clever. <laughs> but he said, remember something, Chris? He said, 
a small band of people committed to the truth can change the world. And I said, really, Mr. Hill, how do you know that? He said, because it's the only thing that ever has. And that's what we got to remember in this state, is it's the only thing that ever has. And so I don't, you know, I don't sit here every day and navel gaze, Quinn, and go, oh, God, what's the state of my party today? Like, I am the party. And maybe you will be someday, too, when you get to vote and decide which party you want to be in and start to shave and all the rest of that. You know? Maybe you will be. And I hope that you don't become a navel gazer, always pondering about what is the current state of whatever. Change it. And if you like it, preserve it. But don't ever give in to it. Ever. Stay on your ground. I'm glad you came here tonight without your mother. That's pretty cool. Oh, is she here? I see. He texted me, and he told me you weren't coming. Last minute. Did he badger you into it? He did. I figured as much. I'm so, so sorry. Good to see you here tonight, Quinn. All right.